If I worked in Hollywood, I would definitely make a film based on this story. This is a story about real nuclear revenge, literally and figuratively. If you listen to this story to the end, you will find out why this is so. The events of this story hardly ever happened in reality. They sound very fantastic. Well, my dear viewer, make yourself comfortable. We're starting. When I looked at the battered black and white photograph that had slipped out of my grandfather's book, I immediately recognized the figure of my grandfather. He stood proudly in his military uniform, his cap tilted slightly to one side. Next to him stood a striking woman in a long skirt, blouse and jacket typical of that era. Turning the photo over, I saw the handwritten words, Grove and Doris, Hawaii, 1946. That was my grandfather's name, Grover Harrison. He's always been just a dad to me. I was wondering who Doris was. It definitely wasn't my grandmother whose name was Patricia. I've never heard my grandfather mention anyone named Doris. Maybe she was his girlfriend from the war. I made a mental note to ask him about it at the meeting that was supposed to take place today. Having prepared everything necessary, I went to my apartment, which was located in the basement of my grandfather's house. He insisted that I move here a few months ago when he was assigned to a nursing home. The explanation he gave was logical. He needed someone to look after the house, and for me, it would also be economically profitable. My grandfather has been suffering from various health problems for a long time. Fortunately, Alzheimer's disease or dementia were not part of his struggle. But his condition deteriorated so much that he could no longer perform his usual duties. Since my parents were no longer around, there was no one to provide him with the necessary care. Although cleaners and gardeners came to him weekly to keep the house and yard in order. But my efforts were not successful. Despite everything I did, it wasn't enough. With my busy work schedule during the week, it was difficult for me to provide him with constant care. Now that he was confined to a wheelchair for the whole day, his dependence on me increased. It's hard to navigate life at 99, he remarked, in his distinctive Minnesota accent. That's when everything starts to wear out. After a quick shower and a snack, I went to the nursing home. Upon arrival, I greeted the nurses at the reception desk, waved to them and checked in. How is my grandfather doing today? I asked Julie, the nurse on duty. Full of energy as always, she replied with a grin. I smiled back. Did he try to pinch you again? I asked. Of course, he tries to do this every morning when I bring him breakfast, she replied. I giggled and headed to his private room. Hey Trey, come in son, he called when I knocked on the slightly ajar door. It's me, Trey Harrison by the way. When I entered the room, I hugged him tightly. Hi, Dad, I greeted. How are you feeling today? Oh, I think I feel good, he replied. We chatted about various topics, fishing, current events, and the general state of affairs. In the end, I showed him the photo I had brought with me. I saw his expression change, sadness, anger, and perhaps a hint of guilt appeared in it. He lowered his eyes and asked, Where did you find this? It fell out of your old military handbook, I replied. I was just curious about who she was. I don't recall you mentioning anyone named Doris before. Was she a girlfriend or someone else? Something like that, he replied with a note of sadness. I thought I had thrown away all her photos. Obviously not. I'm really sorry. I didn't want to stir up painful memories, I said quickly. It's all right, son, he reassured me. I think you deserve to know more about her than anyone else. Why don't you bring us coffee, close the door, and I'll share it with you. Of course, Dad, I replied. I quickly brought two cups of coffee, taking care to get decaf coffee for him. I closed the door and sat back down. I discreetly turned on the recording on my phone, hoping that there was enough space in it to record the entire conversation. After a short pause to collect his thoughts, he spoke in a low, serious tone. I want you to understand that I'm only sharing this with you. Feel free to write this down for yourself, but in no case divulge this information to anyone else. Do you understand the seriousness of my words? I nodded and replied, I understand. I'll keep it to myself. 
He nodded approvingly and took a sip of coffee before continuing. I should probably digress from the topic a bit. When I was in college in my freshman year, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. Like many others, I wanted to join the army. But because of my flat feet, I was declared unfit. Despite the fact that I had never had problems with my legs before, I made this decision without protest. I went back to school and eventually got a degree in physics. Surprisingly, after graduation, the government asked me to help with a special project. It seemed that my flat feet were no longer an obstacle. I agreed and signed my name without hesitation. In a whirlwind of events, I graduated from the officer candidate school, received the rank of second lieutenant, and was sent to the Army Corps of Engineers. To my surprise, I got into the Manhattan Project, where I was assigned to use nuclear material to create a bomb. The idea was unthinkable, but exciting. To work alongside such respected scientists as J. Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi, it was a dream come true. During this time, I have gained more knowledge from them than in all my years of college. I was among a crowd of over 400 people present at the Alamogordo test site during the first bomb test. While waiting for the results, uncertainty hung over us. We did not know if the device would explode. To our amazement, it exploded, changing the course of history on the same day. After this fateful event, I was sent to Tinian, a remote island in the Pacific Ocean, where I was supposed to help prepare and load a bomb intended for Hiroshima. We hoped that these weapons would force the Japanese to surrender. Although the bomb proved effective, the Japanese remained steadfast. In an attempt to hasten the end of the war, we sent another bomb to Nagasaki just three days later. We were all aware of the serious consequences that await us. If the bomb had not exploded, or if the Japanese had refused to capitulate, we would have had to send troops to conquer the country by force, which would have led to catastrophic losses. Fortunately, the bomb was successful. The next day, the Japanese declared their readiness to capitulate. Shortly thereafter, on August 12th, the United States agreed to accept their surrender. The official surrender ceremony took place in early September. I spent some time on Tinian and participated in the aftermath of the Nagasaki bombing. The memories of those days still haunt me, causing nightmares that I can't get rid of. It wasn't just the destruction that weighed on my mind, although it was quite devastating. I was really haunted by the sight of the survivors and the enormous difficulties they had to go through. Although I felt proud to have helped end the war, I couldn't help feeling guilty that the two bombs I had a hand in delivering had killed over a hundred thousand people in Japan. This realization continues to deeply bother me to this day. In February 1946, after submitting the report, I was transferred to the Joint Task Force No. 1 of the Army and Navy. At this time, the news about the Soviet spy group in Canada caused a great commotion. It was around this time that I decided to go on vacation to Hawaii, where I met a charming woman named Doris Hastings. She was originally from Norman, Oklahoma. Doris was not only charming, but also incredibly beautiful. We quickly found a common language and spent many days together dancing and kissing on the beach. It soon became clear that Doris was not only a great dancer, but also a skilled conversationalist in other aspects. She did all kinds of things. This led to a whirlwind romance, culminating in our wedding in the presence of a Justice of the Peace in April 1946. By the will of fate, in the same year I became a participant in Operation Crossroads, a series of nuclear tests on Bikini Atoll. Plans for the third test were cancelled, and in 1947 I re-enlisted and was assigned to joint nuclear tests in Nevada. Doris and I moved to Las Vegas, just an hour away from the new testing center, looking forward to the next chapter in our lives. Believe me, the situation at that time was not even close to the one it has turned into now. Despite this, we continued to go about our daily business, and it seemed to me that everything was going smoothly between us. But one day, returning from the test site, I noticed Doris's car parked at a motel on the outskirts of town. It must have been in 1948, 
although my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. I couldn't help but wonder why she was there. There was only one scary version that came to mind, and it did not bode well for our relationship. I paused recording when there was a knock on the door. My father and I looked up and saw a young woman enter the room. She came up to my grandfather with a smile. Are you ready for therapy, Mr. Harrison? She asked. Only if you take me, he replied with a smile and a wink. I couldn't help laughing when I saw the old man flirting with the nurse. She smiled back at him, unfastened the wheels of his chair and guided him to the door. I'm going away for a while, son, he informed me. I'll be back tomorrow and we'll continue, I told my father, hugging him before leaving. After saying goodbye to the nurse, I asked her to take care of my grandfather. She assured me that it would be so. After leaving the room, I headed home. There I rummaged through my grandfather's things in the hope of finding at least some information about this mysterious woman named Doris. Despite the fact that I looked through all his old papers, including diplomas, certificates and awards, I did not find anything that even mentioned her. There was no old marriage certificate, nor any records related to the house in Las Vegas. Looking at my watch, I realized it was time to meet Karen for our date. We've been in a serious relationship for a long time, and I started thinking about proposing to her. When I picked her up, I couldn't help but admire how amazing she looked in a beautiful green dress that accentuated her eyes, fiery red hair, and fantastic figure. During lunch at the Texas Roadhouse restaurant, she looked at me with a worried expression on her face. Trey, are you all right? Are you kind of detached? What is it? She asked. I told him that I had visited my father in the morning. Is he all right? What is it? She asked. Yes, he's as irritable as ever, I assured her. What's on your mind? What is it? She asked, showing genuine concern. Today I found this in one of his old military books, I said, showing her a photo that I took out of my pocket. She looked at her before speaking. Is this your grandfather? What is it? She asked. I nodded. He's very handsome. I understand where you got that look from. He reminds me of actor Errol Flynn. And what kind of woman is with him? I explained that her name was Doris. She was my grandfather's first wife before he married my grandmother. It's very strange to me that he never mentioned her before. My parents never talked about her either. I rummaged through his things, but I didn't find anything where she was mentioned. No letters, no notes, no postcards. And he never throws anything away. It looks like a mystery. Are you going to turn into Sam Spade now? She commented. No, but I'm intrigued, I replied with a grin. I wonder what happened to her. I have friends who make a living searching for documents in open sources, Karen said. I can contact them and see if they can help. If he was really married to this woman, we will be able to find some information. Her name is Doris Hastings, and she is presumably from Norman, Oklahoma, I replied. If there is any information there, I am sure that we will be able to find it, she assured. That would be great. Thank you, I said. You're welcome, she replied with a smile. What did your grandfather do during the war? What is it? she asked. He was involved in the Manhattan Project, I replied. Isn't this the group that dropped the bomb on Japan? What is it? she asked. I nodded in confirmation. Wow, she exclaimed. Yes, he's never talked about it before. He worked for the government until the late 60s and then became a teacher where he met my grandmother, I explained. Hmm, interesting, Karen mused. After this conversation, we finished dinner and decided to go to the city to have a drink and dance. Eventually, we returned to my house where she captivated me again with her attractiveness. In the morning, she woke up and cooked breakfast for us. I got out of bed did my usual morning chores, and putting on a bathrobe, headed upstairs. I found her in the kitchen in just an apron, spreading butter on toast. I hugged her and bent down to kiss her. She laughed and handed me a toast, which I gladly took. I poured each of us a cup of coffee, and we sat down to breakfast. Why did you get up so early? I asked. I need to get home and get ready for work, 
she replied. I knew that she worked at the DMV office, talked to people all day, extended car registration, and performed other tasks. I offered to move some of her things to my place so as not to leave ahead of time. Trey, that sounds like a commitment, she replied with a smile. I asked if I was sure of this, kissed her hand and mentioned that I see myself waking up next to her every morning. I looked at the redhead and her gentle disposition. I promised that I would behave as best I could with her. Of course, she replied with a grin. We can definitely try if you want to raise the level of our relationship. So, what's on the agenda for today? I have a server installation scheduled this morning. If everything goes smoothly, I'll finish it quickly, and then I'll stop by my grandfather's. I can't wait for the story to continue, I told her. Good. I remind you that I will be at my mother's after work. She offered to help me with a project that I started. We'll call you tonight, okay? That sounds like a good idea. Say hi to mom for me, I said. I will, she promised. Mom thinks very highly of you, you know, Karen added. Yes, I really like her too. She reminds me of you in some way, I teased, earning her a grin. Are you still busying for the weekend? Do you remember when you promised me to take revenge on the miniature golf course? What is it? She asked. Of course, I confirmed, and maybe we'll stop by Dad's if you don't mind. Of course. Have you noticed that all he does is look at my feet? She said. I ran my hand over one of her legs. Is it possible to judge an old man? I like looking at those legs myself, I replied. You're such a naughty boy, she joked. Only in front of you, I replied, eliciting a smile. After we finished breakfast, she went downstairs to change her clothes. After kissing her goodbye at the door, I stood and watched her get into the car and drive away. Back in the kitchen, I poured myself a cup of cereal. Karen, my wonderful partner, always ate like a bird. I finished breakfast and headed downstairs to get ready for the day ahead. I only had to install one server, and I was satisfied. For the last few years, my main clients have been computer manufacturers. They supplied the equipment, made appointments, and I handled the installation and maintenance that the customers agreed on. After receiving payment from the client, the manufacturer then paid me for the work. I was happy with the working hours, the pay, and the boss. It was me. The installation went smoothly, and by 2 o'clock everything was ready and functioning perfectly. The customer was satisfied with the new system and signed an act of completed work. I got into the car, quickly scanned the documents using a portable scanner, and emailed them to the manufacturer. After finishing my work, I went to my grandfather. When I arrived, I hugged him, greeted him, and asked how he was feeling. Oh, as usual, I think, he replied in his charming accent. Do you want to know more about Doris? He asked. I nodded eagerly. Pour some coffee and I'll continue, my grandfather suggested. I poured each of us a cup of coffee, sat down, and turned on the recording. So where were we? Dad asked. The fact that you saw Doris's car outside the motel, I reminded him. Oh yes, he said, closing his eyes briefly. After thinking for a while, he continued. After noticing Doris's car that day, I went to Strata's house. She never expressed to me her unhappiness in our marriage. She always showed love and warmth. I was completely unaware of the existence of any problems. It's probably true that husbands are the last to find out about such things. I realized that I needed to gather more information before making hasty decisions. My first step was to pretend that everything was fine, although it wasn't easy. I felt insulted, embarrassed, and very upset. If she was really cheating, it would be difficult for me to react calmly. Realizing the sensitivity of the situation, I knew I had to act quickly. The possibility that this information would be used by a hostile foreign power weighed heavily on me. Remembering the security briefing where I was warned about blackmail tactics, I began to act. I found a private investigator, James Hamm, and made an appointment with him the next morning. Then I contacted my boss, explaining to him the predicament I was in. Realizing the urgency of the situation, he gave me a day off so that I could deal with this issue. As soon as I finished speaking, Doris drove up to the house. 
She came in with a bag of groceries and put it on the kitchen table. On closer inspection, everything looked normal. The clothes were neat, the makeup was not broken, the hairstyle had not changed since the last time I saw her. She bent down to kiss me on the cheek, and I didn't smell any foreign odors. How was your day? What is it? She asked. I think nothing, I replied. Despite the fact that she was my wife, I was not allowed to divulge details about my work, so I often expressed myself vaguely, just resolving issues as they arose. How was your day? I asked. As usual, I did some shopping, then I bought something for dinner, she replied. Did you go out or meet anyone else today? I asked. No, it's the same as usual, she replied. I couldn't believe she had just lied. How long has she been deceiving me like this? I thought. Just curious, I said. When we sat down to dinner, I couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal. What's on the agenda for tomorrow? I asked. Probably the same thing, she replied. I knew she was hiding something. After dinner, we drank some sherry and watched TV on the newly purchased RCA TV. There wasn't as much entertainment in those days as there is now. Milton Burl was our favorite. I always liked the old episodes of Superman and the life of Riley. A hidden camera show appeared around the same time, but you won't find anything like it today. After watching some TV, we eventually went to bed. It was hard for me to behave the same way with her as I did that night, but somehow I managed. I think Doris felt that something was wrong, but she didn't say anything about it. The next morning we had breakfast as usual. I changed into my uniform, poured myself a cup of coffee and went outside. Wanting to maintain a semblance of normality, I stopped by the diner to have more coffee before meeting James. At his office, I was greeted by a blonde chewing gum and escorted inside. James looked up when I came in, shook my hand, then sat down, lit a cigarette and studied me through the haze. I told the details of the meeting with Doris's car at the motel, explained the delicacy of my work, without revealing too much. So, you think your wife is cheating on you and you want me to investigate? Yes, that's right, I confirmed. All right. Give me all the information you have, her photo, the make of the car, the license plate, and everything else that you can provide. It will take me about a week to investigate, he said, making notes. I really want to gather as much information about her as possible, so I will contact my colleagues in Hawaii and Oklahoma to see what we can find out. This process may take several days and incur additional costs, if that suits you, James said. I agreed to this plan without hesitation. It is important to remember that in those days, we did not have access to modern technologies that we have today. In those days, detectives had to put in a lot of effort to gather information. I described in detail the color, make, and number of her car, and also provided a photo to help the investigation. This is the photo you found. Grandpa stopped and frowned. At that moment, I couldn't understand his concern, but later everything will become clear. Then he continued. Then James told me not to worry that Doris might be dating an old friend or relative. He also asked if I was thinking about getting a divorce, to which I replied that I was not sure that everything depended on what he would reveal. Here, he offered, handing me a business card. I highly recommend this lawyer. My secretary will take care of the prepayment. I prefer to get some money in advance to get started, and I bill the rest when I'm done. Of course it suits you, I replied. Contact me in about ten days and I will prepare a full report for you, he added. Thank you, Mr. Ham, I said gratefully. You're welcome, and I wish you luck, Captain, he said, getting up from his seat and shaking my hand. Brushing myself off, I went out and sat down at the reception desk. Looking at the business card in my hand, I asked how to get there, to which the secretary was happy to tell me about it. As I drove up to a quaint house located on the outskirts of downtown, I noticed a sign, Wilbur Capshaw, a lawyer. Nevada was once famous as the country's divorce capital. I parked the car and entered the building where I was met by another blonde secretary who directed me to Wilbur Capshaw's office. I couldn't help but notice the abundance of blondes in the office. 
Wilbur stood up to greet me, shook my hand when I entered, and offered me a seat. What can I do for you? asked Wilbur. Well, I began, I'm thinking about getting a divorce and I'd like to explore my options. You've come to the right place, Wilbur assured me. Do you want to get a Renault-style divorce as soon as possible? I'd prefer it to happen quickly, I said. I can handle it easily, he replied. On what basis do you want to get a divorce? I replied, probably because of adultery, but I'm not sure yet. Well, I don't have irrefutable evidence yet, I explained. I asked someone to check it out for me. By someone, do you mean Mr. Ham? He asked. I replied that it was him, Mr. Ham, and he nodded back. Curious, I asked him how things were going. He asked me how long I had been in Nevada, to which I replied that it had been several months since I was appointed last year. He assured me that there would be no problems with housing, since by law you only need to live in the state for six weeks. He then asked if I could find someone to confirm my presence in Nevada during that time. I confidently confirmed that I can. Satisfied with my answer, he explained the procedure to me. He told me to come to him as soon as I decided to act. He will prepare the necessary documents, file them with the court, and arrange for a lawyer to accompany him to Reno for the hearing. I needed to get to the court on my own, by car or by train. I suppose you have a car, he asked, to which I nodded in agreement. Wilbur explained further, Upon entering the courthouse, you or your lawyer will present your case. If the case is not controversial, then soon you will leave the building a free man with a divorce decision in your hands. If you wish, you can symbolically throw your ring into the Truckee River. Just like that? I asked. Mostly, he confirmed. I'd like to see what Mr. Ham finds first, I replied. I get it, Wilbur admitted. You don't want to give up halfway. But if you don't succeed, remember that you still have the opportunity to divorce her. I once knew a man who divorced his wife because she wouldn't let him listen to the radio. Wow, I exclaimed. Yes, Wilbur confirmed. He considered it cruelty, can you imagine? Take your time, make sure this is the right decision for you, and then come talk to me. I'll be waiting for you here. Thank you, Mr. Capshaw. I'll probably do that. After shaking hands, I said goodbye and left the building. When I was sitting in the car, I was overcome with hunger, and I decided to go back to the diner to have lunch. While eating, I reflected on my recent actions and couldn't figure out where I had gone wrong. I've always treated her with respect and love, but she still managed to hurt me. Lost in thought, I realized that it was two o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't want to spend the whole day thinking about the situation, just as I didn't want to drown my sorrows in alcohol. Deciding to move on, I paid the bill and left a generous tip to the waitress, who treated me with understanding throughout the meal. Driving past the motel where I had seen her car earlier, I noticed that her car was not there. Good, I thought to myself. I decided to go home and pay her an unexpected visit. But when I pulled into our driveway, I saw a strange car with California license plates parked there. I parked next to Doris's car and headed for the front door. My grandfather and I were interrupted by a knock on the door, which caused us to pause his story. I stopped recording when a nurse came into the room. The grandfather smiled at the nurse and said, Already? How quickly time passes when you're having fun. I stood up and hugged him. I should probably go. I'll come back tomorrow if you don't mind, I said. Grandpa replied, more than good, son. See you later. I nodded to the nurse as I left and headed home. When I got home, I checked my schedule for the next day, which turned out to be Friday. Although there was no installation work on my schedule, I had to do some maintenance work that could be done remotely. I sat down at the computer and began to study the information. When I came across some old articles about James Ham, I learned that during the war, he worked for the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. From a documentary I watched on the History Channel, I remembered that the OSS was the predecessor of the CIA. In addition, I found information about Capshaw, 
a divorce lawyer who made a considerable fortune dealing with quick divorces between 1940 and 1950. I want to make it clear that I never doubted my grandfather, but I really wanted to find at least some evidence in favor of his story. Later that evening, Karen called me from her mother's house where she was doing crochet. She often turned to her mother for advice on such matters. How was your visit to your grandfather today? What is it? She asked. Everything went well. I'll probably stop by tomorrow afternoon when I'm done here, I replied. Good. I'm just reminding you that we have plans for tomorrow night, she said. How can I forget about this? I replied. Her laughter filled the air. By the way, my mom sends her regards, she added. In the background, I heard her mother's voice screaming, Hi, Trey! I giggled in response. Please say hi to your mom, too, I said to Karen. She relayed my message to her mother, saying, Trey says hi to you, too, Mom, and then returned to our conversation. I love you, Trey Harrison, Karen began, her voice soft and sincere. I know I don't say this often, but I really love you. I love you, too, Karen, I replied feeling the warmth in my heart from her words. Karen has been through a lot in the past, and her ability to express her feelings meant a lot to me. I'll see you tomorrow night, okay? What is it? she asked. Of course, I assured her. We said goodbye and ended the conversation. The next day I finished work early and decided to visit my grandfather at the nursing home. I wanted to hear more of his stories, Upon arrival, I greeted Julie at the reception desk with a smile and then headed to the ward. After exchanging hugs and pouring coffee, Grandpa wasted no time asking about Karen. How's it going with that redhead? He asked, his eyes twinkling mischievously. What's her name? Karen? My grandfather asked. Yes, Dad. Her name is Karen and we're fine, I replied. Are you thinking of marrying her? He asked. I nodded in the affirmative. He chuckled and said, You know, I wouldn't mind if you two wanted to move in together. I replied jokingly, You mean living in sin? He grinned back. I may be getting old, but I'm not losing my head, he said. She's a positive influence on you, son. Your grandmother will agree with that, too. Thank you, Dad. It's just a pity that the parents are not with us, I replied. He smiled comfortingly and put his hand on my knee. I know, son. I miss them, too. But it's time to focus on what lies ahead. I think Karen should be a part of that future. But that's not the only reason you're here, right? Leaning back in his chair and closing his eyes, he tried to remember where he had left off. You just drove up to your house and saw a strange car in front of the entrance, I reminded him. After reading a lot of stories on the internet, I knew that the presence of a strange machine was a common plot device. Oh, yes, he replied, letting me start recording before continuing. Gathering his thoughts, he began, I parked the car, took a deep breath before entering the house. As I approached the house, a million thoughts raced through my head. What will I find inside? Will I find her in his arms? Will their intimacy be in our own bed? Uncertainty gnawed at me when I crossed the threshold. My gaze fell on a tall, muscular man in a somber suit sitting on the couch. He got to his feet when I entered, and there was tension in the air. At that time, Doris was in the kitchen cooking dinner. She came out of the kitchen when she heard the sound of the door opening and hurriedly wiped her hands on the apron that decorated her house dress. Doris started to explain, I'm just cooking dinner. Meet my cousin Michael J. Smith. He's from Ardmore, Oklahoma. Michael, this is my husband, Grove. Reluctantly, I shook Mike's hand, noticing the remnants of lipstick on his lips and a small scar on his right cheek. Despite his Oklahoma roots, Mike spoke perfect English without a hint of a Western accent, which seemed rather strange to me. It's nice to finally meet you, he said. I rarely crossed paths with people from Oklahoma. Nice to meet you, Michael. I greeted him, gesturing for him to sit down. I'll just change quickly, if you don't mind. Not at all, he replied with a smile. For some reason, that smile made me feel anxious. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was wrong, but something was wrong. 
When I entered my office, I put my briefcase on the floor and checked again to make sure the door was locked. After making sure that everything was in order, I went to the bedroom to change my clothes. I strained my ears to make out their conversation, but I didn't hear a word. Looking around the room with my eyes, I did not find any traces of their activity. I changed my clothes and went back to them. As I poured myself a drink, I noticed that Michael had already done the same. I hope you don't mind. Doris told me to help myself, he said. Since you're her cousin, there's no need to ask. As they say, my house is your house, I replied. Michael thought for a moment before answering. I wondered if he had never heard of such a thing before. Well, thank you, he finally said. We settled down in the living room and Doris stayed in the kitchen. So, what are you doing, Michael? How did you end up in Las Vegas? I asked. I'm a sales agent. I travel a lot for work. I pass through here on my way to Reno. I'm sure it's not as interesting as what you do, he said, trying to encourage me to demonstrate my work. I'm not sure. Since you travel a lot, you regularly experience something new while I'm just stuck in the daily routine. So, what products do you offer? I asked. He replied, Mostly construction materials, nothing retail, just for contractors. You'd be surprised how much was built after the war. I couldn't help but ask about his scar on his arm. Were you in the war? Yes, he confirmed. I also participated in the war, I confessed to him. But I don't think I've seen as many fights as you have in Europe. In response, he just shrugged his shoulders. We were all doing our duty, he replied. Then Doris appeared and called us to the table. As we sat and ate, I studied them the same way they studied me. I couldn't help but wonder if they were really cousins or if it was just a fairy tale made up to deceive me. Then Michael got up from his seat and kissed Doris gently on the cheek. I couldn't help but notice the way she was looking at him, and I felt awkward. It was wonderful. We have to do it again, he said with a smile. Turning to me, he held out his hand, which I accepted. I have to go now. Thanks for the lovely dinner, Grove. It was very nice to meet you. Likewise, I replied. When Michael left, Doris and I were clearing the table, thinking about the strange meeting that had just happened. Handing each of us a glass, I settled into an armchair in the living room. Your cousin is a very nice guy, I commented when she joined me. Yes, thank you, she replied. You two seem very close, I said. We have always been close. It's been many years since I last saw him before he went to war, she confirmed. Hmm, I muttered. She gave me a puzzled look. You look distracted. Is everything okay? She noticed. It's all right. I'll deal with it, I replied, thinking about the recent event. She hugged me with a smile, acting as if nothing had happened. In the days that followed, I remained vigilant and looked forward to what James would reveal. I gave him all the details about Michael's appearance and the car he owned, including the California license plates. A few days later, I contacted James to see if he had any news for me. Actually, yes. Could you drop by my place today when you have time? He replied. I will definitely stop by, I confirmed. I left work a little early and went to his office. His secretary quickly escorted me to the office. Glad to see you here, he greeted, lighting a cigarette. So, what have you learned? I asked eagerly. First, my colleague in Hawaii checked the documents. Did you see the judge who officiated your wedding sign the marriage license? I said no, but when I looked at the documents, I saw the signature. Then the judge assured me that he would take care of filing the documents. As it turned out, there were no marriage records, none at all. In addition, the judge who allegedly conducted your wedding was found dead from a gunshot wound shortly after the ceremony. The authorities have confirmed that you have never been legally married, James said. That's not all, James said. The woman you know as Doris Hastings is actually Russian. I asked in surprise. Are you sure? Absolutely, he confirmed. I thought I'd recognize her face from the photo you gave me. Her real name is Svetlana Fedorova, and she is a KGB agent. The last time I saw her was in Bavaria at the end of the war. I thought she was murdered, but apparently not. 
and the man you know as Michael Smith is actually Michelle Schmidt, a former member of the Waffen SS, he continued. There were rumors in intelligence that he was recruited by Fedorova as a double agent and moved to the Soviet Union after the war. Wow, I exclaimed. Maybe we should tell the FBI or someone else about this. In general, I agree, but I'm afraid it could get you into a lot of trouble. The fact that you were deceived by a Soviet spy will not reflect too well on your record, James said. I had no idea she was Russian, I confessed. James assumed that I had been chosen for a specific purpose. He warned me that my life was in danger and informed me that mysterious individuals were actively involved in the conspiracy. Then he showed me incriminating photos of Doris and Michael in a compromising position. Curious, I asked where he got these pictures from. It's better if you stay in the dark, James advised. But that's not the main thing. Divorce is impossible without a legal marriage certificate. And what's the plan? I asked. I have a solution that will solve all the problems, he replied with a sly grin. We discussed and developed a plan over the next hour. Suddenly, Grandpa stopped talking and met my gaze with a tinge of regret and embarrassment. I paused the recording. Are you okay, Dad? I asked. The next part will be the most difficult for me. I hope you won't judge me for this, he replied. Dad, you shouldn't say anything that would make me think less of you, I assured him. He nodded. I hope you don't stop thinking that way after I tell you, he said. It's okay, Dad, I repeated. I understand. Okay, son, he said, finally ready to share his difficult truth. Well, let's continue, he exclaimed. I pressed the record button. I was looking forward to the day of the next test, following the plan that James and I had developed. His job was to look after Doris and Michael, and he was familiar with their daily routine. Doris seemed to visit Mike in his motel room almost every day. I called James, who informed me that the two of them were currently in a motel room and would most likely be there for several hours. I often returned home in a government truck, as I often used it to prepare test sites. It was my responsibility to make sure that all the preparatory work was done for each test. In particular, I was the last person on the site before the detonation. After receiving information from James about their location, I gathered all the necessary equipment that we talked about earlier. James and I met outside the motel, and we were lucky that their room was on the second floor at the back of the building. James assured me that our entrance and exit would go unnoticed. Following our pre-planned plan, I put on a green jumpsuit and a cap to preserve the anonymity of the military officer. James informed me that they were sleeping. He told me to prepare everything while he dealt with them. I obeyed him and carefully opened the back door of the truck. I took out the ramp and securely attached it to the back of the truck and then opened the metal box that was inside. Turning around, I saw James carrying Doris in a matte shoulder bag. He put her in a drawer and I asked if she was the target. He shook his head and assured me that she would be gone for several hours. I'll be right back, he added, and disappeared for a moment. When he came back, he brought Mike and put him in the drawer next to Doris. Then he went to collect their things and then put them in a drawer. I watched as he handcuffed their hands, making sure the chains were intertwined. He then gagged them with underwear, after which he closed the drawer. They were packed so tightly that it was impossible to get out. When I finished my work, I checked the time on my watch. Do you think you have enough time to come back before the test starts? He asked. I nodded back. Oh, definitely, I assured him. Let me know how it goes, he said when I thanked him and left. By the time I got to the test site, he was diligently wiping everything he touched. I arrived at the place just in time, but I was escorted out by the military police. I thought you wouldn't make it, Cap, one of the guards remarked. I just wanted to have a snack before the test, I explained. They quickly looked into the back of my truck and motioned for me to come over. Take care of yourself, Cap, the guard said, saluting me. I returned the greeting and went inside. I went to the tent where the weapons were being prepared for testing. When I was done with the tasks, I dismissed the rest of the team as usual. Fortunately, 
I managed to park my truck so that I was out of the field of view of the cameras. After making sure everyone was gone, I drove a truck to the tent, opened it, lowered the ramp and pulled out the cart. After some adjustment, I successfully centered the box on the cart. It was not an easy task, but in the end, I achieved my goal. Doris was light, but Michael was as heavy as me, if not more. I found a box containing weapons under the scaffolding and noticed a metal plate supporting the bomb underneath. The plate hid what was under the weapon, and that was my main concern. I unlocked the drawer and opened it slightly. When they moved and opened their eyes, it took them a moment to realize my presence. Their expressions quickly turned to surprise as I knelt down next to them. I know you were interested in learning about our nuclear technology, I began. Well, here she is. It may not be as powerful as the bombs used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it will do its job. And don't worry, you won't feel anything when it explodes. One moment you'll be here, and the next you'll be gone. With a snap of my fingers, I ended my performance, leaving them to contemplate the impending destruction. I saw that Doris wanted to say something and pulled the gag out of her mouth. You imperialist pig, she hissed. I quickly silenced her by shoving Mike's underpants back into her mouth and laughing at her reaction. You're a lying communist trash, I replied. I know everything about you and Comrade Schmidt. You have 15 minutes to reflect on your communist beliefs. And by the way, I want to get a divorce. Goodbye and enjoy hell. She flinched when I forcefully closed the drawer and secured the lock so they couldn't escape. After putting the cart back in place, I disassembled the canvas awning and put it in a metal box, which, as expected, I loaded into my truck. After taking a last look around, I left the area the same way I arrived. Trembling hands and trembling inside accompanied me as I made my way to the observation deck. Without hesitation, I parked the car and entered the building. I joined the rest of the participants, quickly grabbing protective gear as we followed standard security measures. The countdown started, and I braced myself for the chaos that was about to begin. As expected, chaos erupted moments later. I knew that Svetlana and her partner had been destroyed, and no one would see or hear them anymore. Like the rest of the group, I hesitated before turning to look at the aftermath and saw a mushroom cloud shoot up into the sky. With the help of binoculars, I examined the area, which was now called the Zero Point. Despite the fact that I knew that there would be no evidence of my actions, I felt an irresistible desire to investigate. When everything settled down, I, like everyone else, went through the checkpoints, returned the truck, and drove home in my car. When I arrived, I was shaking with guilt. It wasn't like anything I'd done before, and I was afraid of the consequences. It's over. I confessed to James over the phone. Okay, he replied calmly. Wait a day or two, and then put her on the wanted list. And if you need to talk, I'll be there for you. I will do that. Thanks for everything, I said, feeling grateful. He laughed. Wait until you see my bill, he replied. I laughed for the first time all day. Grandpa fell silent, his eyes full of guilt and sadness as he looked at me. I stopped recording. It's okay, Dad, I reassured him, hugging him. You mentioned that they were going to kill you as soon as they were done. By saving yourself, you also protected our country from two dangerous foreign agents. You have nothing to be ashamed of. He nodded in agreement. I tried to tell myself that, but it still weighs on me, he admitted. I understand, Dad, I replied. After all, you were in the war, remember? You did what you had to do. It's either you or them. And personally, I'm proud that you did it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. A tear glistened in his eyes as he smiled at me. I never thought about it, son, he confessed. You're the bravest man I know, Dad, I praised him. I'm proud of you. He hugged me tightly, and his tears soaked my shirt. After a few moments, he wiped his eyes and looked at me. It seemed that the burden of guilt and sadness had been lifted from him. Maybe sharing this with you is what I've needed all this time. I've been carrying it inside me for so long, he said. I'm glad you shared this with me, I said, wanting to hear more. 
The grandfather added, After waiting a few days, I decided to file a missing persons report. A few days later, the authorities informed me that her car had been found at the motel, but there was no trace of her being there. They suggested that she might have met someone and left with them, implying that I might never hear from her again. Despite this story, my grandfather and I treated the situation with humor, joking about the unlikely scenario in which she could contact him. And what happened next? I asked. James suggested that I go to Capshaw's. We both agreed that it would be better for me to pretend that the marriage was real, even though we both knew it wasn't, he said. Capshaw filed for divorce, saying that my wife left me. I quickly flew to Reno, and the divorce was finalized in a matter of minutes. Following his suggestion, I stopped at the exit of the city and threw the ring into the Truckee River. For a while I was afraid of the consequences from federal agents, but they never caught up with me. Then I quit my government job and started a career as a teacher, where I crossed paths with Patricia. The rest, as they say, is history. Curious, I asked how Svetlana managed to keep in touch with her superiors. In response, he just shrugged his shoulders. I have no idea I never found out, but I think it doesn't matter now, does it? He admitted. Probably not, I agreed. Our conversation was interrupted by a knock on the door from the nurse, who informed us that it was time for dinner. I said goodbye, and he turned to us with a request. Be sure to bring your lovely girlfriend to us, he said. I will, Dad, I promised. Maybe tomorrow, if you don't mind. I'm looking forward to it, he replied. That evening, Karen and I decided to spend the evening having dinner, drinking, and dancing. She brought with her a mysterious paper bag, which, according to her, contained a surprise. After a passionate evening spent together in my apartment, Karen turned to me and asked, Are you okay, Trey? I replied, Yes, but why are you asking? She expressed concern, saying, It feels like you're detached, like you're lost in thought. What's on your mind? I opened up to her and said, Today I visited my father, and he told me his story to the end. I told her the story briefly. Wow, I definitely wouldn't want to run into him, she said. I grinned in agreement. Let's visit him tomorrow. Maybe after I beat you at mini golf, she suggested. Of course, if you want to, I replied. The next day we played a game of mini golf and she really beat me. After that, we went to my grandfather's. On the way to the nursing home, she took a bag with her. His face brightened when he noticed that we had entered the room. Hello, sweet girl. He greeted as she hugged him warmly. I have something for you, she said, handing him a paper bag. He eagerly opened it and took out a plastic container with a blanket, which contained an Afghan plaid. With her help, he unfolded the plaid and looked at it with admiration. I just recently finished working on it, she explained. I remembered how much you love such things, and I created this one especially for you. Smiling, he picked it up and said, It's just great. Thank you. I really like it. Turning to me, he said, Son, if you don't marry this girl, I will. Agreeing, I took one of Karen's hands in mine and knelt down. Looking into her eyes, I confessed, Karen, I love you madly, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you become my wife? At first she seemed taken aback, but then a wide smile appeared on her face. She wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me on the cheek. Oh, yes, Trey, she exclaimed. I'm going to marry you. I love you so much. I love you too, I replied. When we turned around, we were greeted with applause from the side of the door, where several nurses and my father were standing, smiling. A few months later, we exchanged vows and became husband and wife. The nursing home arranged for my grandfather to join us at church for the holiday. During the celebration, he handed me an envelope with a first-class plane ticket to Las Vegas and a hotel room. Over time, his health deteriorated so much that he had to be transferred to the hospice wing of a nursing home. My wife Karen and I tried to spend as much time with him as possible. Despite the weakness of his body, his mind remained sharp. It was obvious that he had come to terms with his past and no longer felt guilty. During my last visit, he was in a clear state of mind, 
and shared with me that he had found peace with God and was ready to reunite with his beloved Patricia. Don't worry about me, son, he whispered. One day we'll be reunited. I love you. I hugged him tightly as he peacefully passed away. Tears were streaming uncontrollably down my face. Through my sobs, I managed to say, I love you too, Dad. I saw the familiar playful smile that I had adored since childhood and realized that now he was resting in peace. Karen came into the house, hugged me, and we mourned his loss together. He was buried in military uniform in a beautiful ceremony in honor of his service next to his beloved wife, Patricia. The honor guard carefully folded the flag covering his coffin and solemnly handed it to me. He fought bravely for his country and deserved any recognition, I thought to myself. A few days later, I received a letter from his lawyer requesting my presence in his office. Intrigued by what he wanted, I decided to meet with a lawyer. Your grandfather left you everything, he informed me. The house, the money, all of it. That's a pretty significant amount, even considering his recent expenses. If you want, I can put you in touch with a financier who will help you manage it. When he finished speaking, he handed me a large sealed envelope that looked quite old. He also left this for you, the lawyer said. I kept it safe and sound for several years. I have no idea what's inside, so it's a mystery to both of us. Your grandfather said that the envelope could only be opened after his death. Thank you, I said in response. I would also like to arrange a meeting with your financier, I added, noting that there was a significant amount of money left in the inheritance. When I got home, I finally opened the envelope and was shocked by its contents. It turned out that Dad had saved everything, including James Ham's report, the yellowed divorce certificate from Doris Harrison, and even a photo of their former home. That evening, Karen and I looked through the documents, feeling out of place. It turned out that everything my father said was really true. The last page we came across was a copy of an old official report written in Russian, probably part of a collection of documents from the former Soviet KGB. The English translation turned out to contain field reports compiled by a woman named Svetlana Fedorova. In these reports, she expressed her concerns to her superiors in Moscow, suspecting that her target might have found out her real identity. In her first reports, she mentioned that she had developed a close relationship with a man who was well-versed in American atomic weapons. Although she didn't give his name, it was obvious that she was disappointed that she couldn't get valuable information from him. She informed her superiors that he was only interested in physical intimacy and watching capitalist television. Subsequent messages indicated her growing frustration with the situation. Her superiors urged her to be more persistent in her actions. In the last message, she mentioned that she and Michelle were up to something serious. I'll deal with him as soon as I can, she assured her superiors. Karen and I thought it was funny, and we laughed. The KGB report stated that both Fedorova and her German assistant had disappeared without a trace. There were rumors that they had escaped, but they were never found. The mission was deemed a failure. They don't know anything, I said, causing Karen to burst out laughing.